called the Church Planter, accidental missionary, and the co-founder and president of every nation. His primary function is to develop and empower leaders in every nation for the future to help launch every nation's seminary. When he's not at his home in Nashville or Manila, Steve can be found either on his motorcycle or on a Delta Maryland flight. Author, motorcyclist, pops to four grandchildren. very much that <laughs> when I saw that video it was a different voiceover uh, that was my five and a half year old granddaughter so <laughs> it was a much older voice when I <laughs> when I previewed and approved the video so <laughs> Carlos you and your team always have a trick up your sleeves <laughs> Wow um, ah, this has been quite a few days. Brett, Cynthia, thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Um, the last three days we've looked back at our first 25 years. Some of us, our relationships and working together go way beyond 25 years, but officially as this ministry pursuing this vision, 25 years. Um, we've intentionally, as I'm sure every one of you have noticed, tried to push church planting, campus ministry, and world mission. Um, we pushed it in your face, in every session, in every way we can, uh, running it across every radar we can. As important as our mission is, church planting, campus ministry, world mission, there's something far more important than that. My sermon tonight will be not just a look back at 25 years. Bryce did an amazing job to start us off recounting the amazing things God has let us do together. I want to look into the future, 25 years, yeah, 250 years, 2,500 years, even beyond that. My text is a glimpse into the future, a look beyond time into eternity. And the text will clearly identify what is way beyond the mission God's called us to do. Danny Meyer. Whoa, is the founder of Union Square Hospitality Group. He's, and in that group, they have approximately, I think it's more now, but 18 or so very successful restaurants in New York City. Many years ago, when Danny was a brand new restauranteur with his first restaurant, Union Square Cafe in New York City, he was extremely frustrated as a young man with a successful business because it seemed like their core values of hospitality and excellence seemed to regularly disappear. And he was sitting with his mentor who was an older restaurant owner in New York City with some colorful language that I can't quote tonight. Um, Danny sat down and vented to this mentor, sitting at one of his restaurants around a table. The mentor listened and finally he had heard enough and he said, Danny, move everything off of the table. Every plate, every fork, every flower, get it all off the table. And they cleared the table, and then he reached over and got the salt shaker. And he handed it to Danny, and he said, Danny, I want you to put this salt shaker right exactly in the center of this table. So Danny takes it, looks at the edges, puts it in the center. No sooner did Danny let his fingers go, his mentor moved it three inches, put it back. Danny moved it back in the center, and immediately his mentor moved it all the way to the edge, put it back. He moved it, moved it, put it back, move it, put it back, and Danny obviously recognized this is a Mr. Miyagi moment. 
What is the point? And his mentor said, your job as a leader is not to get mad when people move your values and your culture off center. Your job is to put it back. Every day, someone will move your culture off center. Every day, someone will move your values off center. Sometimes, he said for him, sometimes it's your waiters. Sometimes it's your cook. Sometimes it's your maitre d'. Sometimes it's your accounting office. Sometimes it's the New York food critics. It'll keep getting moved off center. Some people move it because they're bad people and they want to make your life difficult. Those are the exception. Other people move it because they think they're actually helping you. Some people move it because they're just so busy they don't have time to pay attention exactly where it goes. Some people don't share your values. Some people do, but they're negligent. Whatever the reason, your job is not to get mad at them, but to move it back because that's what leaders do. And he said, the moment you get tired of moving your values and culture back to the center, that's the day you should quit your job and let someone else do it. Don't ever surrender your values and your culture. That's what he said. Now, what does that have to do with us? This conference, we have gone to a lot of expense, a lot of time, a lot of energy to gather together somewhere in the world every three years. You know what we do? Basically what the GO conference is, it's us moving the every nation salt shaker back to the center. It's simply what we do. We're just moving it back. And you know what? It constantly gets off center. There are so many good things that can be done in the name of God and for the glory of God. But we're not called to do all of them. There are certain things we're called to do, but life can push us off center. And we have moments like this where we collectively push it back to the center and say, that's who we are. That's what we're called to do. We honor and recognize everybody else and what they're called to do. But this is our part, our piece of the puzzle. That's what this conference is about. Now, my text, as I said, is a look into eternity to help us understand what that salt shaker ultimately is. I guess our penultimate salt shaker is church planting and campus ministry and world mission, but there's something else. Let's look at this. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. We have sung it, we've prayed it, we've spoken word it. If that's something you do, we've seen this all over the place. Here we go. After this, I looked and behold... A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun, sh- the sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. To properly understand, interpret, and apply the book of Revelation... 
we have to look at Revelation 1, 1, the first five words of John's letter. Here's what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember that next time you read Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ. It's not a revelation or an unveiling or a description of the Antichrist, the beast, the 666, some computer system in the Netherlands. It's not an unveiling of the rapture in the millennium. The whole thing is so that we could see Jesus. And if we will read Revelation to find Jesus, we'll find him. If you read it to find that other stuff, you will find all kinds of crazy things. And you can write bestseller books about them and have TV shows. But we're going to go with this as a revelation of Jesus. Let's find him in here. Of course, John wrote this and John starts out as this provincial fisherman. He's a teenager. He's the youngest of the 12. He's the only one of the 12 who didn't die a violent death. Um, But when we first meet him, he's a young, probably teenage fisherman in Galilee, working in the family business, working for his dad, working with his older brother. Now, Galilee was a lot more diverse than Jerusalem, but a lot less religious and a lot less sophisticated. Galilee had a very peculiar accent, like a lot of maybe country folks do. I was born and raised in Mississippi. Um, When I go back and visit relatives, I speak that dialect. Um, Let's imagine someone from my hometown or maybe someone from East Tennessee, live in Tennessee now, going to New Jersey. And getting in a conversation, people would automatically know you're not a local. That's kind of how the Galilee accent was. Now, John had probably inadvertently rubbed shoulders with non-Jewish people in the fishing business, selling the fish in the market or just, just in doing business, but never intentionally, never would he have had a meal at a Gentile, non-Jewish home, but I'm sure he had bumped into people because it was quite a diverse place. Next time we find John in the Gospels, he starts following this Jewish itinerant rabbi. So he's a Jewish believer, I mean a Jewish person with a Jewish rabbi, but now suddenly his world is growing because he's coming out of his province and now he's going to big cities. But he's also now not inadvertently encountering non-Jews. Jesus intentionally went out of his way to encounter non-Jewish people, people of different ethnicities and different cultures and different languages and different eating habits. And John's world was growing. And the more he walked with Jesus, the more his world changed. The more he walked with Jesus, the bigger his world got. He now wasn't just in a little fishing village. He was around multitudes of multiple thousands of people. He'd probably never been in a crowd like that. He's seeing miracles and he's experiencing miracles. His world is changing and growing. The more he walked with Jesus, the more diverse his world became. The more he walked with Jesus, the bigger his world became. Is that happening to you as you walk with Jesus? As you walk with Jesus, is your world getting bigger? Your vision's getting bigger. Your dreams are getting bigger. Your experience is getting enlarged. I hope so, and I hope your world is becoming more and more diverse as you walk with Jesus. And I hope you're encountering intentionally, not inadvertently, but intentionally people who are far from God or seemingly far from God and very different in experience than you are. That's what happened when John followed Jesus. Now, when we look at this message, We see that we remember when we read about John in the Gospels, he was called in the Gospel of John, the beloved disciple five times. Now, he did write that, but very secure young man. The beloved disciple. Please note this. Everyone in this room is a beloved disciple. But just because John was the beloved disciple, he was not exempt from suffering. 
He was not exempt from carrying a cross. He was not exempt from persecution. He was not exempt from tough times. And I've got a feeling you won't be either. But when things don't turn out like your Peter Pan happy thoughts, it doesn't mean you're not a beloved disciple. It probably means you are. Our text is about something John saw. Verse 9, he says, after this I looked and behold. In other words, I saw something and here's what I saw. When I read that, I think about a jigsaw puzzle box. Okay? Don't you think that when you read that? Behold, I saw. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who love jigsaw puzzles and the rest of us. I have three amazing daughter-in-laws. Two of them love jigsaw puzzles. I am told by jigsaw professionals, jigsaw best practices include starting with the edge. And when you get the edges done, then the center becomes more obvious. Also, on the jigsaw puzzle box, what do you find? It's a picture of what all your work is supposed to produce. And the more you look at the box, the more you figure out, am I going the right direction? Am I putting this together properly? Am I doing this right? If you don't have, now there are some crazy people who do jigsaw puzzles with no picture. But when you have the picture, you look at it and you know what your work is supposed to look like. This text is our jigsaw puzzle box picture. What all of the work we do together is supposed to look like. We're not making it up as we go. We're looking at the box top. Okay, is what I'm doing contributing to that picture on the box? Is it looking more and more like that? Or is it all still looking like it used to? So what is this thing that John saw? You know, they have jigsaw puzzles. I I do them with my granddaughter with like two dozen pieces or maybe up to 50. She's good at it, better than me. But there's some with thousands. But if you think about us in the kingdom of God, there are millions of pieces, billions maybe. The first thing John saw, actually saw two things in this text. Behold, I looked, and I looked, and behold, or I looked, and here's what I saw. The first thing he saw were people. People. And he describes the people. A great multitude that no one can number. Can I just say it this way? Get used to big crowds. In your campus ministry, no matter how big it is now, get used to it getting bigger. In your church, no matter how big it is now, big or small, get used to it getting bigger. John saw a multitude no one could count. There's a lot of people. And when I think about the puzzle pieces, sometimes it's easy to get lost in the shuffle with this 5,000, 6,000 people we have here and just feel insignificant. But you know what happens when you ever finish a puzzle and there's one piece missing? It's incomplete. And I want every one of you to know this movement would be incomplete without you. Every one of you. Every single person matters. I'm glad we're all in this together and I'm glad there's a lot more. So what did these people look like? There was a great multitude no one could count. Secondly, he says they're from every nation. There are 193 official member nations in the UN. We are working right now with churches and church plant teams in 80 of those nations. That gives us 113 to go. Those nations we're not in right now with every nation churches include Algeria, Argentina, Belarus, Chad, Chile. If your name's Chad, that might be a call. Costa Rica, Finland, Guatemala, 
Ethiopia, Libya, Russia, Somalia. That's 13. That means there's 100 more I didn't list. Some people responded last night. I think you're going to go to some of those. In three years, or in about an hour from now, we're going to announce where our 2022 conference is. And if we're still only in 80 nations, when 2022 hits, if we're still only in 80 nations, we have failed. I don't know how many we'll be in the next time we gather, but it needs to be more than we are now. So what did these people look like? They were multitudes. They were from every nation. They were from all tribes and peoples and languages. Interesting about languages. Christian missionaries sometimes have been criticized for colonizing and disrupting cultures and languages. That has happened and they've been rightly criticized. But what they haven't been recognized often enough about is a Christian mission has actually preserved cultures and tribes and languages. Actually, there are about 7,000 languages spoken in the world today, and one-third of those are endangered. They're dying. But there are hundreds of languages that have been preserved that would have been extinct if not for Christian missionaries who had translated the Bible into that language. Because once a culture gets the Bible, they have a pride in their language and their culture and their tribe, and they've been preserved. There are religions that are very missional, that believe there's one language of God, and they go in and they do colonize in the sense of, we will bring this language, and this is the language God speaks, and this is the language of God's word. That's not how Christian missions think. It's not. There is no holy language in Christianity. There's not. It's not English. It's not whatever kind of accented English I have. We're going to go in and honor every language and every culture and every tribe. We have experienced the power tonight and yesterday and the day before of singing and worshiping in other languages. And I, it doesn't even matter the song. Those moments are always the most powerful moments we have because it sounds a little more like heaven than just doing one language. I thank God for the miracle of tongues in the book of Acts, because then you could hear and understand in your own language what's going on in another language. But what's interesting is a uh, number of scholars would say that the miracle of tongues on the day of Pentecost was unnecessary. Peter preached in Aramaic, and most of the people, perhaps all of the people, could understand every word he said. They came from all over, but they came from Jewish communities that were used to Aramaic, and they also, many of them, spoke Hebrew, plus whatever dialect from where they came. The miracle of tongues was unnecessary, but here's how much God values language. He did a miracle, so they heard Aramaic in their own native heart language. Language matters to God. It should matter to us. What were these people like? Great multitude, no one could count, from every nation, from every language, and also it says they were clothed in white robes. What's amazing about this is that it says that they were washed in blood. Think about the robes. Some of them were brown, some of them were green, some of them were blue, they were different colors, and you take those garments and you dip it in a bowl of blood, red, and it comes out what color? White. How does that happen? Well, there are a lot of miracles we have to believe. That's what happened. We'll get to that in a moment. And finally, verse 14 tells us about these people. Remember, John saw two things. He saw people, and it says that these people came out of the great tribulation. If there is one piece of this giant jigsaw puzzle I would like to take and destroy so it could never be put in there, it's this piece, tribulation. I don't want that, but that was because of my upbringing. Many of us, particularly Western Christians in a developed world, have the luxury of believing that we will miss the tribulation and be raptured. Few in the global south have the luxury of believing that. They think it's ludicrous because they experience tribulation every day. Now, 
there's the, the tribulation, but I think there's also the concept of tribulation and trials and tough times that's in this text. Pastor T, I won't say his name or his nation, I think we'll put his family on the screen, is the every nation pastor in one of the poorest nations in the world and one of the most restricted nations when it comes to religious freedom in the world. Three weeks ago, the voice of the martyrs flew him to Germany to be one of the keynote speakers at their 50-year anniversary conference. He's heartbroken that he couldn't be here. The U.S. government denied his visa. September 14th, Pastor T, after spending six months in prison, the judge finally announced his sentence. Four years in the worst, most dangerous prison in his nation. He was transferred immediately. His crime, preaching the gospel and showing the Jesus film. He was guilty of both. Five days later on September 15th, 2014, Pastor T had an angelic visitation in that prison. He described it to me, he said it was just like reading in Acts chapter 12, except instead of Peter being delivered out of the prison, it was me. And he woke up thinking, was that a dream? Was that a vision? What happened? And within a few minutes of waking up, the guards came and, ex and, and took him out. He was free. But he was only free to house arrest. Now that took four more months in front of the judge in trial. In January 19, 2015, the judge let him go. Now, letting him go means that he went and continued to preach the gospel knowing he could get arrested any moment and thrown back in prison. And so what he did during that time was plant the second Every Nation Church in his city. In this room, we have Every Nation leaders who did get visas, and they're here, who have been arrested unjustly. They've been imprisoned. They've lost basically everything they own from some of our Chinese, some of our Iranians, people in Vietnam, different places. They're in the room. We're not going to stand them up or anything. We don't want them on video. I met with one of those leaders yesterday. I won't say the nation, in a restricted nation. He told me yesterday that his government is offering a thousand dollar, thousand U.S. dollar reward for anyone who will report an underground church meeting. I asked him, what message do you have for our EN conference delegates. We were sitting in the restaurant over there. He said, here's what he said. I quote him. He said, making disciples is essential. The government can stop us from meeting publicly, but they cannot stop us from making disciples. I'll give you an example of that, how the government can't stop that. I received these pictures this morning from Bishop Ferdy Kabiling. This is a water baptism. Our pastor in this city, in Central Asia, on the Afghanistan and a couple of other country borders between Pakistan and Iran, right on the border. This pastor baptized five people last week. That's the baptismal service. The government cannot stop God's people from making disciples. I heard a sermon by one of my seminary professors last month. And he said that there's a sign in the Himalayan mountains for people who climb the mountain. And he said it's the sign in multiple languages and it's, it lists the fees that you pay the ne Nepal government to climb the mountain. And, and, it, and it said that the fee for climbing, summiting Mount Everest, and it put the amount in different currencies. It's about 11,000 US dollars, but by the time you do all the other things, it's about $60,000. And um, there was a information under that and it said here's the fee and then it said this get this it said discounts available for lesser summits I thought about that and I thought we don't have the option of choosing lesser summits we're not offering discounts here there's one summit God's called us to scale and the reason we don't offer discounts is the next thing John saw and I'm gonna wrap this up quickly he saw people from multiple nations, huge crowds of languages and tribes and, and their white robes, and they've been through tough times. They've been through 
difficulties and persecution and tribulation. But here's the other thing he saw was a throne. In our short text, seven times, throne, 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 throne. When a word is repeated that many times in one short text, there's a point being made. The throne's not where we sit. The throne is where the king sits, where the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's where he rules. Now, this vision starts in chapter 5. I don't have the time to go talk about the thrones there. It's all over chapter 5. We hit chapter 7. It continues on to chapter 19. And I want to kind of wrap up with this thought. Chapter 19 and verse 13. This is still what John's seeing. He's looking up at that throne and he says, he is clothed in a robe. Here it comes again, dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And this is the same John who wrote in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And then it goes on and says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he's saying, this is the word. This is that same Jesus I walked with many years ago. I'm looking and there he is. Verse 14, he says, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him. Here's this one on the throne with red robes. It's already said they're dipped in blood. That's why it's red. And those following him are in white because his robe is red. He gets to sit on the throne of our lives. Because his robe is red, because he spilled his blood, he gets to be Lord and King. Because his robe is red, he makes the rules and he rules the world. Because his robe is red, our clothes are white. Because his robe is red, like in that text, we follow him wherever he goes. This whole text, this whole sermon, this whole conference has been about moving the salt shaker back to the center because life knocks it off. Yes, we want to reach every nation and every campus. We really do. We'll do just about anything to do that. But the lamb on the throne is our ultimate salt shaker. The mission is not. The lamb on the throne is the ultimate center of our churches, our ministry, our families, our lives. You know, I said, The jigsaw puzzle, it starts with doing the edges, and if you do the edges, you'll figure out the center. The Christian life is exactly the opposite. We start with the center. And if we get the center right, the edges will fall in place. So what we're here to do No matter how it gets off center, and it does in my life, I know it does in yours, but we're here to push the lamb on the throne back in the center of everything we do. December 1732, Leonard Dober and David Nishman were being sent as the very first Moravian missionaries. They had sold themselves into slavery in order to reach the 3,000 slaves in a particular sugarcane plantation in the West Indies. Their last words to their weeping families became the motto of the Moravian movement for the next hundred years. Here's what they said. You've heard it. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. When the lamb is on the throne, He deserves our all. 
In a moment, we're going to receive communion together as a spiritual community. But before we do that, I want to take a moment, just a moment of silence. I don't want every one of us to take a moment. No guilt, no condemnation, because the truth is there are times that life pushes our center to the edge. It happens regularly for me. And it's moments like this when we can push not the mission back to the center, but the lamb on the throne.